Uh, my name is Brandon Layton. I'm a software engineer on the dispatch core team. And I'll be talking a little bit about distributed locking at Uber and why it is important when building reliable systems. Now in this presentation, I'll give you a little bit of background about distributed locking, talk about the solutions we have built and the trade-offs of each of these solutions. Uh, first, uh, we need to kind of get an understanding of distributed systems problem space. So I'm gonna talk a little about the CAP theorem. Now, the CAP theorem is a fundamental part of distributed systems describes the trade-offs that we need to make when designing a fault-tolerant system. Do we need availability, consistency, or partition tolerance? During failures like network partitions, we can only guarantee two of the three. A consistent system guarantees that every read will serve up the most recent write or error request, while an available system will guarantee that every request is met with a non-error response, but with no guarantee that that response will be the most recent write. And a partition tolerant system guarantees that it can continue to operate while requests are dropped or delayed. Now I'm going to give a real world example uh, that will that'll give us a little bit of insight into why consistency is important in our systems. Now imagine we have a trip uh, that we're about to, that just got offered to a driver. Now at the same time, the driver accepts the trip and the rider attempts to cancel this trip. Our system receives these two requests in parallel and attempts to process them. After each individual request is processed, we're in two very different states. In one of the states, the driver has been assigned to the trip and we want to move on in the state machine. After the rider cancel has been processed, the trip is canceled, it's terminal, there's no more state to be done. We'll notify the driver and move on with our lives. But when they're, they're processed in parallel, which state wins? Which one's the source of truth? When there's no consistency guarantee in our system, where you, there's just no way to know. Whichever state ends up being persisted into the data, data layer will become our source of truth. We ensure consistency in our system by acquiring lock leases from NCs when we operate on them. Now in this example, it's the same order of events. We have a trip that's offered to a driver and the rider cancels and the driver accepts them. But this time there's a little bit of a difference. When a rider cancel comes in, we acquire a lock on this transaction, which forces the driver accept transaction to wait for a lock on that entity. During this time, we'll process the rider cancel request like we did previously and then determine the trip state to be canceled. After this has been occurred, we will pass along the serial, we'll pass the, like, we'll release the lock, and then the lock will be acquired in the other transaction, the driver accept transaction, and then we will process that transaction. The distinction here is now we have the most up-to-date state machine. The job was canceled. So when we process the driver accept transaction, we know that it is invalid. You cannot accept a canceled trip. So we'll error the request out and notify the driver. There is a deterministic end state in these sequential transactions. Now, locking gives us a guarantee that only one transaction is occurring at a given time on an entity. This allows us to give some level of consistency in our system. Of course, like anything else in distributed systems, there are multiple ways to implement locking, and each implementation comes, implementation comes with trade-offs. And I'll talk about the two solutions that we built, RingPop and Distributed Lock Manager, or DLM. Now, here at Uber, it's really common to use in-memory locks along with sharding as our locking solution. This ensures that only one worker will be handling requests for a given entity, and the in-memory locks will ensure that those requests are not being computed in parallel. RingPop is our open source sharding solution. It uses a gossip protocol, SWIM, if you, if you care about that specifics, to propagate the cluster's state to the participating nodes in the cluster. RingPop also leverages consistent hashing to minimize the number of keys to rebalance when our application cluster changes. Using this consistent hashing, RingPop provides a method to forward requests to the node that should own that request. Now I wanna talk a little about the trade-offs that we make when we use RingPop. Unfortunately, requests coming into an application built on top of RingPop incur extra hops. A request for trip A will hit some worker, which will then determine whether it owns the trip or not. If it does not own that trip, it will forward the request to the worker that it thinks owns that trip. During really bad cluster flaps, a request can actually be proxied around a cluster multiple times before it finds a wor worker that should actually own that trip. This is a symptom of RingPop's eventual consistency. Another trade-off we make uh, is due to RingPop's sharded nature, uh, we can be, or hotspots can occur. A single trip must be handled by a single worker, so naturally that worker can get overloaded when a single trip starts hitting us really hard. And no JS applications, which sadly we still use, uh, is particularly bad for this, right? Because it's a single thread. So a single badly behaved entity can bring down a worker. RingPop also has some vulnerabilities during cluster changes due to its eventual consistent nature. 
I'm going to walk through a real scenario that is very possible and will cause consistency issues in our system. Now, first, we have some request that comes into our cluster, which is forwarded to the worker that should own that request. Then the worker goes down, and we can't handle that request. The coordinating node will then forward it to the new owning worker. and It'll start processing that request. When the original worker comes back up, it will regain ownership of that job because it's consistently hashed. And then we may start processing another request that came in and got forwarded to that worker. These two requests will be handled in parallel. You know? Repop can't guarantee 100% consistency during these changes because it, it has to eventually propagate the cluster changes throughout with using its CASA protocol. Now, network partitions are also really scary failure mode in distributed systems. And because of Repop's dynamic scaling ability, we can end up with two completely different rings in our cluster. And this has happened several times, causing outages. With a split brain, we'll have two completely different nodes thinking that they should own a given entity. If a request comes into ring A, it'll be forwarded to that node down there. If it gets, comes into ring B, it'll be forwarded to the other node over there. They, will, they can process the requests in parallel of one another. Now at some point, a cluster can just no longer horizontally scale when it uses gossip due to the overhead it incurs when you need to communicate across the entire ring, or entire cluster, rather. Now, one of our services in Marketplace is upwards of 1,500 nodes per cluster. We've just about reached the limit Gossip has. Each node needs to communicate with 1,499 other nodes, and Gossip, the cluster state with, uh, throughout. <laughs> now, instead of trying to scale out, out individual clusters, at some point, we're forced to spin up additional clusters and redistribute the load. Now, pods, the same pods that Emma was talking about earlier, we use that, them for that. They're used as a form of subsharding. So then we can spin up additional clusters and, and change how we shard into them to redistribute the load. Now, since we shard by region, as we grow by region, we can easily spin up additional clusters, additional pods, and route traffic into them. That's how we solve, solve the gossip problem. Now, the other solution that we built is DLM. DLM acts as a decentralized locking interface for applications. So they don't need to worry about sharding their clusters to be able to get a lock guarantee. You know, at some point though, sharding in state is necessary. But what we can do is push the state down as far as possible, get it out of the application layer. DLM was built to allow services that don't necessarily need to manage state outside of requests to still have some consistency on their state transitions to become stateless. And we push this lock state management down out of the application layer and into infrastructure. Services can now receive a request for a transaction in any of their nodes, acquire lock from DLM, execute the transaction, and then release that lock. Becomes, it would be very stateless, very lightweight. Now, I'm going to give a really high-level overview of what DLM's architecture looks like. This is the three major components. The application layer in DLM, the cluster management, uh, we use Apache Helix, and Cassandra, which is our state persistence layer. DLM uses uh, Cassandra's compare and set writes to consistently write those lock states. Now, here we're diving a little bit into how routing works for DLM. DLM's cluster state management, Apache Helix, will push any of its cluster states up into the client application, where a fat client will keep mapping of the partition ownerships so that when we need to route a request to a DLM worker, we know where to send it. Now that we have some idea of how DLM is designed, I want to describe what a normal request lifecycle kind of looks like. First, requests will come into the application. This can be any sort of application. Now, before the application starts handling that request, what it will do is attempt to acquire a lock for the entity that it's processing on. Now, once it has acquired that lock, it will start sending heartbeats to DLM, letting it know that that transaction is still alive, that entity is still being worked on. And the reason that we do that is we, we want to know when the application dies. If a worker is doing some sort of transaction on an entity, we want to know as soon as possible if it's no longer doing that. We don't want to wait for some hard-coded TTL. So that some, when some other worker is doing a process on some entity, we can quickly release the lock and let that person start doing work. And of course, at the end of the transaction, we will release the lock from DLM so work can be done somewhere else. Now that we have some idea of how DLM generally works and how the interface looks between the client layer and DLM, I want to talk about some fa failure scenarios, you know, some very basic scenarios. I talked about this earlier in RingPop, where we have a network partition in our application layer. There, we had split brain issues, but here, luckily, since DLM is decentralized, as long as it's also not under network partition, everything's fine. We still have a consistency and availability guarantee. We move on with life, so nothing's wrong. 
And during network partitions in DLM's cluster, everything is also fine. We have a decentralized cluster management. The only time we actually need to worry is when there's a network partition between DLM's layer and the Zookeeper in Apache Helix. Although I may make it seem like DLM is uh, the silver bullet here, the best locking solution ever, uh, there are limitations that we ran into. Uh, mainly that Cassandra's CAS writes just don't really scale very well. Uh, these CAS operations, we kind of need them to persist the lock state. You know, for systems that re require 100% consistency guarantee, it's very important. However, we developed something that we call non-strict mode. What this does is it sacrifices some consistency during failures to handle the throughput that certain services require. The aim here was to mimic the consistency guarantee that RingPop gives us while still having a decentralized locking solution. With DLM's non-strict mode, we just completely get rid of the Cassandra dependency. We maintain all lock state in memory. What this does is it allows us to scale independently of Cassandra. We no longer have to rely on cast writes. Unfortunately, during failure scenarios, we will lose all lock states inside of that, the workers that go down. But what we do is we minimize those, that window of failure through the heartbeats that I was talking about earlier. If a worker of DLM goes down, a heartbeat will come in in 100, 200 milliseconds and then reacquire that lock. For the future, we're looking at ways to improve DLM. Uh, we're experimenting with CockroachDB as our consistent state persistence layer. And instead, of, instead of Cassandra, you know, for a better strict mode, we're also looking at some form of internal consensus protocol, something like Raft, to ensure and to completely get rid of any sort of need for a lower consistent state persistence layer. So I talked a lot about the trade-offs that RingPop and DLM have. I talked about how gossip just doesn't scale. At some point, we're forced to subshard and continue scaling on our applications. I also talked about how sharded applications are, uh, have a propensity to acquire hotspots, and that really plagued our Node.js applications since individual workers are single-threaded. I also went over how RingPop can, conser can, can acquire consistency issues during cluster changes. And the stateless applications relying on a decentralized locking system do not fall victim to the same pitfall, and it's kind of why we're moving that way in the future. They can deploy as many times as they want with 100% consistency guarantee as long as the, uh, the layer, the decentralized locking system itself doesn't deploy regularly. Now, one benefit I didn't really talk about that sharded applications have is it's actually really easy to debug them. When you're looking at your logs, one worker owns one entity, so you should see all the logs for one entity and one worker in your logs. It's very easy to wrap your head around the state transitions that should occur. But with a decentralized approach, that's not true. You'll be looking through your logs and you'll be see workers hopping around in entities. But that's just something that you should, you should fix with tracing. As you can see, there's just no one size fits all solution for locking. When you're building rel reliable systems, you kind of just need to understand your problem space so you can make decisions accordingly. Now, thank you very much for listening. That's all the time I have. If you have any questions, you know, come up afterwards, or if you just want to talk to distributed systems, I'd love doing that.